Hi, Carrie. Uh, Mr. Burt, this is Thomas Keegan, LibertarianProgressive.com, calling in. Hello there. How are we doing tonight? We're doing great. And, you know, we, um, we're we delighted to know that uh, you decided to spend uh, at least part of your Friday evening here educating and informing the public about what's going on in American politics, especially Kansas District 1. When we really appreciate that. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks for being on the ballot. So, uh, you know, we have this purpose to interview you here. And also, um, you know, hopefully uh, people in your district can thank you. And even if you're not in District 1 in Kansas, you know, you might be in New York, you might be in Alaska. I mean, you might find this very interesting. And um, so, Carrie, um, let's uh, actually let people know where they can find more about you here. It's uh, BURT, B-U-R-T, 4, F-O-R, Kansas. Dot com, Bert for Kansas dot com. And so if I may ask you just, you know, the introductory question here, um, have you run for office before? Um, if so, or even if not, what inspired you to run this year? Uh, what's your approach to um, your campaign? And uh, and then we'll go over some of the issues later. Uh, but we appreciate you again being here for this interview this Friday night, September 30th, 2016. Absolutely. Oh, uh, well, no, I'm a novice to campaigning. This will be my first ever uh, uh, campaign that I've ever run. Uh, still kind of learning the ropes to it. There's a there's a, a lot to it, a lot more. If you haven't ever run a campaign before, there's more to it than uh, you can possibly imagine. Um, I, you know, I wanted to run because, uh, you know, I'm an air, I work as an aircraft mechanic. I'm part of the aviation industry, and I've seen firsthand what a government that is too involved in a particular industry does to the economy. They've regulated my industry, my work that I've loved, nearly into obsolescence. And it's, it's, it's tragic, and it's happening all across the nation. And the more, I, the more I was paying attention to what was going on in the government, the more I could see that, uh, you know, the more I could see that its only desire is ever to expand, to get larger, to become more powerful. And I just can't, I couldn't bear the idea of seeing what had happened to my industry continue to happen, but to happen to other people too, and to happen to people's personal lives. So, you know, I'm running with a message of smaller government, getting the government out of our industries, out of our lives, out of our businesses, so that we can feel, we can be free to live our lives the way, you know, we're meant to, free. So as far as my, you know, the campaign going, you know, obviously, as is true of a lot of libertarian candidates, you know, don't have a lot of funds to work with. Uh, we're trying to run a smart social media campaign. You know, you'd mentioned my website. You can also find me at uh, facebook.com slash kb4hr. Um, we're trying to get some uh, some good live streams going. We're trying to uh, um, just uh, use, uh, use the Internet and uh, modern media to uh, – spread our message, and uh, just really wisely use the money we have. Otherwise, uh, if you're not familiar with Kansas's first district, uh, it's actually one of the largest districts in the United States, so it's an incredibly difficult district to campaign in. Um, I've driven thousands of miles already just back and forth from uh, candidate forums and debates, and I've got uh, many, many more to go. So it's a, it's, it's a very difficult campaign, um, but it's an interesting one because uh, currently we have uh, three people running for, uh, for Congress in the 1st District. We have a Republican, we have an Independent, and we have myself, of course, the Libertarian. So it's a really interesting race because there's no Democrat. Uh, our incumbent Republican congressman was actually voted out during the primary. So I, I, I can... I, Honestly, I don't know of a single other race anywhere in the nation that's anything like this one. So the first is just kind of an exciting place to be, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens here come November. Wow. And so you said you've um, been in some debates. If you could tell us about that, and are there any other debates uh, coming up where it's going to be all the candidates in the debates? Right. Uh, well, you know, the debate, it's, it's gone really well so far. Um, you know, it's, again, it's something I didn't have a lot of experience with. I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to go. Um, but people are really surprisingly open to messages from, from third parties for, or, and from ideologies that they're not familiar with. You know, the presidential campaign this year is, you know, sucking all the oxygen out of the room politically, or at least that's what I thought. Uh, but, you know, showing up to these smaller venues um, to, you know, talk to groups of 100 or less for the most part, 
we're really getting a lot of a lot of positive reaction. I have a lot of people coming up to me, even if they don't necessarily agree with what I have to say, who really appreciate the fact that there's a different ideology being represented. I think it's hugely encouraging. I think that the the two party culture, not just at the very top of the political spectrum, but lower down as well, is really sort of starting to shift, and uh, people are really opening their minds to newer ideas. It's actually really encouraging, and uh, I'm really excited about it. I have an event coming up this weekend in Garden City, which will be way out in western Kansas. That'll be on a uh, actually be Monday. Um, that'll you know it's very very rural. It'll be kind of different than what I've been doing uh, so far. Um, and then uh, after that, I have events in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, uh, Junction City, um, Russell, Kansas. You know all you know you know that my whole entire district is fairly rural, so uh, so uh, a lot of smaller farmer communities. Uh, but it'll be really exciting to see uh, to see what happens, and uh, I'm I'm really I'm really like I said really interested to see what happens come November. All right, great. And now um, I did kind of get the uh, the gist of uh, you know your platform, the government over regulating. Uh, you do have a list of issues here at Bert for F O R Kansas dot com, and. Um, and basically, it's uh, it says in forward slash issues subsidy subsidies government spending marriage equality uh, military intervention actually uh, so it's interesting what you um, wrote here about marriage equality could you explain that to our listeners um, how uh, you would approach uh, approach that as an issue this season sure well. Marriage equality is something that has really uh, been gaining ground, and I think that given enough time, the culture is going to change on this anyway. What most people don't understand about the marriage equality issue is that they're looking at it the wrong way. See, they're looking at it, well, should, you know, gays, straight, however you want to look at it, have the right to marry? Should this group or that group have the right to marry? A better way to look at it is, why does the government have anything to do with marriage at all? It's a contract between two people. And, you know, the origins of uh, of the marriage equality argument actually comes from uh, uh, post-Civil War, where during the Jim Crow era, states would try to uh, prevent um, minorities, you know, blacks, Hispanics, uh, Asians, from marrying whites. And so they would institute marriage licenses. So they would have a legal framework against basically to uh, discriminate against people. Uh and the idea that that, I, that that notion has carried forward into the modern era is, is frankly embarrassing. I don't, I don't see how this concept has any place um, in the modern narrative. So now the question becomes at that point, what can we actually do? And most of it has to be done at a state level. Um, I'm a big Tenth Amendment guy. We have to keep, you know, drop the power down to the states where our good – you know, small government uh, politicians on the state level can work to deregulate stuff even further. So my my idea, for, my my focus on this is the argument that I always get when I say we need to do away with the idea of the marriage license is they say, but what about the tax benefits? Well, you know, if we're going to be truly all about small government, you know, we we don't need to be giving out tax benefits to people just for bearing, being married. That's just all, – all that is is it's a structure around which they can build this framework of inequality. So we do – we we roll back our, some of the, some of these tax incentives for marriage, something, again, that the government should have nothing to do with, and uh, that will de-incentivize states issuing marriage licenses, which can bring it back to a purely legal or religious contract. Um, and this will actually uh, protect everybody's rights better. It will protect the rights of the people who simply want to engage in a civil contract. And it will protect the rights of uh, religious individuals who do not wish to participate in one form of marriage or another because it will not be regulated by the state. All right. So basically your stance is um, equality under the law, e- equal justice under the law. Um, you know, everyone treated the same in that. And, yeah, I hear exactly what you're saying there. Um and so hopefully no one's getting married just for tax benefits, I hope. Um, well, I'd like so, to uh, think not. <laughs> I'd like to think not. Yeah, there might be one or two out there, but uh, but yeah, I don't think most <laughs> people are. Um, now, uh, what about subsidies? Um, 
you know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of subsidies, uh, and, and that's another issue about equality under the law, isn't it? Uh, and very much principally, I guess you could say some of the same ways. I mean, not everyone's getting equal subsidies. So uh, what does Carrie Bird, how do you pre- approach uh, government subsidies? Well, you know, again, the problem with subsidies is we tend to look at it in the wrong way. So many things are just a matter of optics and perspective. The problem with subsidies is that they've been built to us as, look, this group is in need, we need to help them. And being naturally charitable, we think to ourselves, yes, I want to help them. But there's another way to look at this. The proper way to look at this is that the government is looking at you, the work that you have done, the sweat that you have put out, and saying, good work, but this group deserves the money that you worked for just a little bit more. So we're going to take it from you, and we're going to give it out to somebody else. And this is infuriating to me personally um, because we we end up with, with protected groups. We end up with protected industries who are deemed too critical to not get extra money from the government. In my own and, you know, in my own race, you know, if I lose for anything, I'm sure it'll be this. But, you know, I stand against farm subsidies. Um, there's a, you know, there's no reason that we should look at a baker or a fisherman or an aircraft mechanic, any other industry, and say, good work, but we need to take your money and give it to these people because they're just, what they do is just more important than what you do. It's morally and ethically wrong, and industries become dependent on it. A subsidy is a lot like a regulation in the sense that when it's in place for long enough, then that industry will build around it, and it'll develop around it. It can't grow organically or holistically the way uh, the economy is meant to grow, the way industries are meant to grow, and so you end up with a structure that becomes self-supporting. So even 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 some of these subsidies that were originally put in place to uh, as temporary uh, means of supporting you know industries that were in distress you know all, you know the farm bill and some of the uh, some of the farm subsidies that exist come about as a direct result of some of the failures of uh, of the North American Free Trade Agreement so I think that anyone who passed uh, those subsidies when they eventually came out would have looked at them and said you know these are never going to these are never meant to be a uh, to be uh, ongoing they're going to go to a certain point when the problem solves they end well they never actually end because the industry grows around those subsidies so if we really want to have a truly free market if we really want to have a healthy industry then we simply have to get rid of these subsidies it'll be hard but um you know a little short term pain is a lot better than perpetuating uh, what is, you know, really a, a terminal cancer on our free market economy. Gary, when you said, um, you know, the growing organically, that just gave me a picture in my mind. I have to admit here. Um, so, so I kind of see what you're saying here. Um, I just, so like if I had a garden and I had a plant, and I had some like weeds growing around it, you know, and if I kept fertilizing the tomato plants, I'm kind of subsidizing that tomato plants. And if I kept pulling out the weeds around it and never gave them anything, it's kind of like treating the rest of us as weeds and, and treating certain groups as like that tomato plant that I want to grow. Now that might be fine for my own garden, you know, um, because I can, you know, I'm purposely growing that. But when you're talking about a public institution that's supposed to treat everyone equally, he can obviously see that's not fair. Now, I do appreciate you being honest, saying like that could be the issue that you, you know we're, that that you could potentially lose on. But so let's be fair about it, though. Um, so if you're willing to say that, there has to be something overarching that you feel uh, strongly about. That um, you know because there's pros and cons, I guess, to everything. So if that's a con, if it is, uh, what are some of the pros? What what would be the over you know, the bigger picture where everyone would benefit, um, you know, more so than, than they would not benefit from losing some subsidies potentially. Well, the biggest gain that I can see is 
if we stop perpetuating things going the exact same way they always have, because that's what it is, when we subsidize when we subsidize uh, failure, uh, we ensure that that's the only outcome we'll ever get. We don't encourage, you know, we don't encourage innovation. You know, we don't we don't do anything like that. So, so so you know, an industry will end up stagnating. It'll stay the same. We won't see any big advances because people aren't going to take risks to do things differently when they know they can continue to do the same thing, fail, and get paid for it anyway, right? That's not that's not a critique of of farmers or a member of any particular industry because it's just smart business. If it's set up that way already, you can fight the tide and lose because you're playing against a different set of rules than everybody else's or you can take advantage of the structure that exists. So I'm not saying that it makes anybody a bad person or uh, that it necessarily makes anybody uh, less, uh, you know, less on a moral high ground than anyone else. But it does create a framework where there's no real desire for innovation. But the, innovation, but the innovations are out there. We can be doing the things differently. You know, there are fantastic technologies out there today with, uh, you know, the, with a GPS, you know, with uh, uh, the, the advances yeah. in hydro, yeah, hydroponics, aquaponics, you know, farming, just as an example, there are entirely different ways that we could be doing it, but we're not doing it those ways. You know, I, 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 keep telling, I keep telling people about this awesome thing we have. We, we just had the new, a new uh, hydroponics garden. It's actually an aquaponics garden open in our town. And, uh, you know, they're doing it. They're raising food year-round in an indoor facility that is com- a completely closed-loop system that's self-supporting. And they're hugely successful and outside of the normal mainstream system. So, you know, they're not necessarily getting the subsidies. They're not necessarily benefiting from these. And they're doing it in a completely different way because they've taken themselves outside the normal structure. And if we can do that, if we can get people, you know, if we can get people off of the government, we can get them off, you know, because it's like a drug. You get hooked on it. You get, and then you need it. That's what a subsidy is. It just breeds necessity. If we can get people off of that, then we can get them to doing different things. And I believe that here in America, people have a, the spirit of innovation. And I believe that if we simply let them loose, they will innovate in ways that, you know, we may not even be able to imagine. So what does freedom mean to you? I mean, you know, this is, I guess, uh, just a very general question here. Um, but, what you, but I mean, it means something to everyone. I, I mean, more to you personally. I mean, what is your story of freedom? Well, what does it mean to you in day-to-day life? What does it mean to your community? You know, why, why is freedom so important? Well, freedom is about personal responsibility more than anything else. It's about understanding that nobody's going to do it for you, that you have to do it yourself. On the other hand, it's about understanding that nobody is going to hinder you from doing it. So, you know, as I've been telling people on the, as I go through the campaign trail, and again, I don't know if it's a message that people like to hear, but I tell them, you know, if you have a problem with homelessness in your community, if you have a problem with, with drug addiction, you know, if you have a problem with failing infrastructure, that's not the government's problem. That's your problem. You as a citizen, it is your problem. Because if we're really going to sit here and say, I want to be free. I want freedom. I want the government out of it. Then we have to fill the gap. Um, we have to be the ones who, you know, if we see the homeless guy out there on the corner, we can't be the ones who say, ah, oh, whatever, you know, government's going to take care of it. We have to take the initiative and go out and take care of it. If we know that the drug, drug addiction is a problem, instead of saying, you know, ah, oh, the cops will go pick that junkie up, we need to be the ones who have the compassion to say, no, we are going to deal with that. We are going to try to help those people, and sometimes that'll mean, and sometimes that'll mean going into uncomfortable situations, and sometimes there will be people we can't help, but, and there will be situations that we can't help. But it's about having the personal responsibility to know that we have to try. That's a that's a part of the of a freedom that I think gets missed a lot. People talk, well, it's about me being able to succeed. It's about me doing this. It's about me doing that. But it's also about us taking responsibility for our communities and uh, and for each other because we're we're asking ourselves and our, our fellow citizens to fill a role that you know has been filled by government for far too long. 
Yeah, if you take up, I mean, it's, I've done the math before, and I, I don't have articles all prepared in front of me, but if you take up all the government contracts, federal and state, and added them all up, I mean, it's a huge percentage of, you know, how much is spent publicly every single year after year after year. And it's going to some people, and it's not going to others. Now, some might say that it benefits everyone, but it does not benefit everyone equally. Let me ask you specifically, in 2008, um, you know, there was that financial crash. Some people call it the Great Recession. And, you know, a lot of industries were bailed out. Um, you know, and there's lots of examples, like you said, for NAFTA. Uh, some people were, you know, the legislators who passed NAS NAFTA um, wanted to, um, you know, I guess they were trying to be considerate of some industries that might be affected. So they gave them some subsidies. Uh, but and now people are talking about what if there's another recession coming up um, or there are some other bank failures that they might what, – what would happen if they needed to be bailed out again? Um, so if you were elected as uh, Kansas's um, district number one representative to the U.S. House and let's say some big financial institutions, some big insurance companies are too big to fail, I mean, it would be widespread, you know, systematic – uh, panic, um, you know, would you, uh, vote to bail them out, um, per se? No, no, I would not. I don't think that that's healthy for a free, for a free market economy. Um, if a business huh? is making poor business, poor decisions, it doesn't care what kind of care if it's a bank. I don't care if it's a car company. I don't care if it's the mortgage. I don't care what it is then they're creating a situation for themselves that uh, is leading them to failure. And, you know, and, and, and to be fair, you know, some of this, you know, the, the uh, last of banking bailout uh, came about as partially a result of actions taken by the Federal Reserve. I mean, largely because of actions taken by the Federal Reserve. Again, interaction from the government, well, in this case, a, a non-governmental private organization, uh, that causes a, uh, a industry to grow in an unhealthy manner. But the way I like to look at this is, um, let's go back to the garden analogy. If you uh, if you simply replant the same plants every year that are from the same genetic strain, that'll work for a while until a disease comes through that those plants never had an opportunity to build resistance to. They don't have the genetic resistance built in, and they'll all be wiped out. That's what happened during the, the Irish potato famine. They, uh, they kept planting the same seed potatoes over and over and over again, and then, you know, a, a fungal disease came through, and it killed everybody out, and almost everybody in Ireland starved to death. Um, that's what we're doing with our industries, is we're just replanting the same things again. We're not giving them the opportunity to build resistances. So what you do instead is you plant different strains. You let them develop. Some of them will die off. Some of them won't. But the ones that do survive will be strong because they've figured out how to weather the storms. They've figured out what works and what doesn't. Because if you, all you do is you keep building out the same gigantic industries over and over again because they're too big to fail, all you do is you send them a message that no matter how badly they screw up, It'll be fine because Uncle Sam will jump in and rescue them. So you're going to continue perpetuating the problem. Maybe not that same specific problem, but you'll perpetuate the idea that if they do something stupid, it's fine. You don't want to do this. That's why our economy continues to go into recession, and each one tends to be worse than the last, is because they find some new stupid thing to do that sinks the country into a recession. We need to to back this off yeah and it's really not fair to um like let's say those um some of those companies you know did suffer the consequences and um you know what what about uh, i mean or what about the up-and-coming you know mid-sized banks that didn't need the bailouts you know they probably would have bought up the big banks or, or the pieces of them and restructured them and and they didn't make the bad decisions so it's really not Fair to them, I guess you could argue, because they would now be the big banks and they might be smarter, actually, and we might be in a lot better situation. But instead, their competition got bailed out and they're still midsize while the other ones are still too big to fail, even bigger to fail. And 
you know, or if I was a salesperson working at a car dealership and I kept, you know, being number one in sales every week. But uh, if my buddy who wasn't so good at sales kept getting bailed out, you know, I mean, that would probably get on my nerves, you know, but uh, <laughs> so, but um, now let's move to um, government spending. Uh, you had something called the penny plan. So this sounds pretty practical. I mean, you know, we got into a little bit of the philosophy there and some practicality, but uh, yeah, can you um, tell us about uh, your advocating here? Right. Well, I'd love to take credit for this, but the fact is that I, I shamelessly stole it from people smarter than myself. So basically what the penny plan is, is we agree that we're going to cut one cent out of every dollar of federal spending across the board. Now, the great thing about this plan is you're going to get a ton of pushback on this thing, because on this, on this sort of thing, because the argument always is, well, this program is vital. We can't cut here. Fine. We won't cut there. But for every dollar we don't cut there, we cut two cents somewhere else. So we end up cutting the same amount of money across the board. It just can be distributed however we want. So, you know, we, we, we end up creating a situation where nobody can say, you know, well, this pet project of mine has to be saved. But if they try, if, and if you end up having people who are trying to, you know, push the issue saying, well, we can't cut this or that, you know, the other individuals in, the, in Congress and the Senate are going to look at it and look at that individual and say, well, if we don't cut from your program, then you're going to be cutting into our program. So there's not going to be a big incentive for people to want to fight this because they're just going to make themselves the enemy of everybody else in Congress. Uh, so uh, I really feel like this, this is this is a good plan because it's a plan that everybody in America can understand. You know, the issue I think with a lot of our spending plans is that they end up being hugely complicated, overly complex. You try to explain to the American people. They can't understand them. And uh, now my dad was really fond of saying that if you can't understand a deal, it means you're getting screwed. Well, all these spending plans that keep coming down the pipe, they end up being hugely complex, thousands of pages long. Nobody can understand them. And the reason nobody can understand them is because, you know, the people in power don't want you to know that you are, in fact, getting screwed, that this, you know, isn't actually doing what its build is doing. You know, we have people – on Capitol Hill right now saying that, well, you know, there's no possible way we could ever cut any sort of defense money, even though we know that that's, that that's rubbish, that recently $8 billion simply disappeared. Nobody has any idea why it's there. And for some reason, we can't audit the Defense Department despite this. Uh, you know, we understand that there's huge waste in, uh, in, uh, in among social programs. It's, uh, across the board, we've, we've become far too careless in our spending and this plan lets the American people see that there is a simple way of going about this. And what's, what's even better about this is there's no way that you can logically resist it and not seem like an imbecile because there's no reasonable way. And there's no way that the American people will tolerate it if one of their elected officials comes up and says, no, there's no physical way that I can cut one penny out of a dollar of federal spending for my project. So there's a lot of incentive for people to cooperate with this. I think it's a good plan. I think it's a plan that's work that'll work. And best of all, it's a plan that people can understand. Kerry, yeah, I think it uh, actually. Um, wow, it's. I've never heard of this penny plan before, but um, it does seem very interesting. It says your analysts have demonstrated that this plan would reduce spending by 7.5 trillion over the course of 10 years. Now we're about 19 to 20 trillion dollars in debt right now. So basically, if now the penny plan, like, well, let me just start out with this. I mean, anyone that's been listening up to this point, um, again, we're talking with uh, Carrie Burt, um, Burt for Kansas, F O R dot com, Burt for Kansas dot com. And he's running as a libertarian for the first district of Kansas. Um, as a libertarian on the ticket here for the U.S. Congress, uh, he's going to be on the ballot November 8th, 2016, about 39 days away. And so, you know, a lot of people might be a libertarian. You're just going to cut everything. People are going to be on the streets. But that's, you know, um, you're talking about more freedom here. And actually, I would say this is very, very mainstream, very moderate. I mean, you're talking about one penny. I mean, it's a huge compromise. One penny um, for every dollar. Uh, 
you know, I would almost say you could, if you cut three pennies out of every dollar, we'd be out of debt in 10 years. I mean, if one penny would cut <laughs> $7.5 trillion and we're $20 trillion in debt, we could be out of debt and have a, you know, a completely balanced budget in 10 years. But, you know, but you know, I think I would be happy in, in the trajectory of just one penny out of every dollar uh, over, over the next 10 years. And let's just see where we are in those 10 years. I mean, um, I mean, it seems very moderate. It seems like, you know, you're not going to be putting people on the streets. You're not going to be, you know, just like toppling over everything. I mean, it seems very moderate, actually. Exactly. It allows us to roll things back slowly because, you know, you hear, you hear a lot of these plans where people come up with saying, you know, we're going to cut this department and this department and this department just immediately. And the, the problem with just immediately cutting something out is that it creates a vacuum. And, you, you know, like I said, industries, um, you know, people's lives have evolved around these government programs. Um, and while I would love to see them gone tomorrow, you know, I understand that to a certain degree we're going to have to wean people off of this stuff. You know, I'm not an uncompassionate person, and I don't want to see anybody on the streets, you know, but I do want to see the country move in a more positive direction. Yeah, another garden analogy. You don't want to get plant shock, you know. So. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. That's great. And so now let's. Uh, you have, um, you know, I'm saving this uh, one issue here, I guess, for last, not on purpose, but it just um, happens to be military intervention. But I think this is, um, you know, a very core issue here. And so, yeah, please uh, tell us about the issue of military intervention, sir. Right. And in one way, this ties in with everything else we've talked about. Obviously, you know, the endless wars, police actions, interventionism that we've been involved with has been hugely expensive. I mean, tragically expensive. And I think on some level, it's it's a little bit horrifying the way the politicians will spin this so that any individual who is opposed to us being involved in every single place in the world militarily is uh, painted as unpatriotic or somehow uh, or, or somehow vilifying America. What I think is unpatriotic is the idea that we would spend trillions of dollars in countries uh, engaged in military actions that do nothing but leave them in more chaos and uh, leave them a worse place than what we came. Um, that's Frankly, that's not our job, and it's certainly not what we should aspire to. Uh, just look at Syria, Libya, um, uh, let Yemen to a lesser extent. To, in one way or another, we've contributed to those disasters. Iraq has gone from being you know, ruled by a brutal dictator to seemingly a place where freedom might take root to being ruled by nothing but chaos. Uh, we're not we're not improving these places. I'm going to speak specifically to the Middle East because I think that's what we can all connect with the most. Um, I, we've been involved in the Middle in the Middle East in one capacity or another since since the Cold War, since we tried to essentially since we started you know arming Afghanis to fight the Soviets, and that eventual and you know one of those Afghanis being Osama bin Laden. But uh, we have uh, – our chickens have come home to roost on this. Decades of failed policy in the Middle East have led to where we are now. Trillions of dollars spent, countless lives ruined. Americans Americans are dead and for wars that we don't even understand. It's time to admit that we have no idea what the hell we're doing in the Middle East. We don't understand the culture there. We – we don't understand anything about the place, and it's time to stop trying to cram freedom down their throat because freedom is something that you have to arrive at yourself. You know, the Americans fought a bloody revolution for freedom. Nobody came and gave it to us. You can't simply give somebody freedom. Freedom has to be something that you discover yourself. This is pretty personal for me, too, because my brother serves in the armed forces. He's a He's an airborne medic uh, stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. And I hear these politicians in both parties talking about, well, we need boots in the ground in, in Syria. We need boots in the ground in Libya here and there. Well, you know, that's all well and good. But my brother's in two of those boots. 
and I have no interest in him being killed in some desert hellhole because some politician needed to pick up some votes. I'm not interested in that. And I sure as hell am not interested in him being killed because the Saudis wanted to make it a little bit easier to ship oil from one place to another. That's another issue that runs tangential to the, uh, to the issue of militarization around the world is this idiotic policy of we're going to sell weapons to just whoever asks for them. But we just signed a multi-billion dollar deal to give weapons to the Saudis that they're going to use to continue terrorizing the country of Yemen. You want to talk about a forgotten war, talk about Yemen. That place is being obliterated in large part by the Saudis. It's every bit as terrible as, as, uh, as the scenes that we see coming out of Aleppo. But, you know, we, we simply let it go by. And I'm not sure I understand exactly why we continue to put up with it. But America needs to get out of this out of this mindset of we're always going to be at war. I understand that September 11th was a terrible thing. And, and I'm not and, and, and we should never forget what happened. We should always be vigilant. But we've allowed it to shape every single part of our lives. We've given up our, our Fourth Amendment rights. We've given up you know our our right to peace we've 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 embroiled ourselves in continuous war every day of our lives since then and it's time to slow down stop and just think for a moment that maybe there's another way that maybe just because something terrible happened to us more than a decade ago doesn't mean that we need to put our entire future at risk because if that happens the you know the people who attacked us on on September 11th, th- then they've won, then they have won. So uh, I'm not willing to surrender to those people. I'm not willing to surrender to politicians who tell me that uh, my rights are secondary to somebody else's bloodlust. Wow, wow. So so in summary here, I mean this is um, you know you talked about. We start out with um, the principle of marriage equality, and that could be any subject. It's really about equality under the law. And we talked about subsidies, um, you know, a level playing field, uh, entrepreneurship, the free market per se, a real free market, um, not crony capitalism, but just the opposite. What, uh, you know, why people emigrate here to start up their own and to make it or not make it on their own. And just, you know, that same spirit that was in the Wild West, the same spirit that people came here without any guarantees, but uh, every possibility of an opportunity. And then we move to um, government spending, where it's very moderate, one penny. It's the penny plan. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to be a libertarian to get behind that. I mean, you could be a Republican, a Democrat, Green Party candidate. I think almost anyone could see logic, like you said, in the penny plan and the military intervention. And, you know, I think you said that very, very well. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, I, uh, now um, there's something a follow-up question I had with that. Uh, okay, so let me put on my neoconservative hat, my cynical neo, <laughs> you know, rhino hat on for a second, um, and uh, you know, my Bill Crystal, Dick Cheney hat here. Um, so, you know, Iraq, the Middle East, is in America's strategic interests. Our military uses um, a lot of oil every single day. In fact, you know, more than some small countries actually, and so. If we don't secure those oil fields, um, you know, and this has nothing, of course, to do with, you know, freedoms for other countries. I mean, it's all strategic, uh, you know, and there's so many businesses invested in that section. Um, so what say you about that? And I'm sure you have a good answer. But, you know, let me just ask that to you, because maybe some people wouldn't ask it that way. And I know that sounds cynical, but um, but, you know, I bet some people do think that. What um, how would you respond to that question? Sure. Uh, well, first off, I, I reject that premise. Um, you know, the fact is is that uh, between the uh, um, the uh, Alaskan oil fields and you, you know, in amongst the Aleutian Islands and the Canadian oil sands, uh, between those two, there's actually more oil than there is in all of Saudi Arabia. Um, America is leading the way in innovations when it comes to accessing oil that was previously unacceptable, unacceptable rather, uh, with horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing. Uh, you want to talk about why gas prices plummeted a few, you know, just a few, uh, just, well, it's been about a year now. 
they plummeted because suddenly we could access oil that we'd never dreamed of accessing before. This, the technology didn't exist to get to. Well, now we can get to it. And the Middle Eastern countries, you know, Saudi Arabia in particular, but all of the OPEC countries had to scramble to push their prices down to the point that they were actually losing money on oil uh, simply to try to put American uh, oil companies out of business so that they couldn't afford to do any further exploration. That is a good place to be from a market standpoint. That tells me that we can we can provide our own oil. We can provide our own resources. We don't need these. We don't need to be going to these horribly volatile regions and doing business with people with horrible human rights records, and essentially acting as the military of the uh, royal family of Saud, simply so that simply so we can access their oil because we have our own oil. And you, you know, and there's another aspect to this too. We're fighting and dying and killing and destroying for a technology that is on its way out. You can see every day I read stories about how we are moving closer and closer to a time when oil simply won't be as necessary as it is now. You know, our our oil consumption, uh, actually uh, Europe's oil consumption, has actually gone down over the last decade. And uh, the United States isn't quite there yet. But it's on its way. You know, you know the advent of more, uh, um, well, the, I mean, the obvious is uh, electrical technology with like uh, Tesla, electrical motors Elon powering, Musk. like yeah. Tesla, exactly. The, we have these private innovators who are coming up with fantastic technology that, uh, that, that is making it less and less necessary. You know, uh, we, we're going to need fewer petroleum products in the future for uh, things like plastic. You know, I, I I probably don't tell have to tell you the libertarian. You know that uh, hemp can be used to make plastics. Um, there are various other uh, um, uh, chemical compounds that are being experimented with right now that can be used to uh, to make uh, things that are superior to plastics. You know, oil is simply not the technology of the future. It's the technology of now, and that's fine for now. But for us to bleed and die and destroy all across the world to maintain a status quo technologically is, is frankly a waste. Yeah. And that, and that maybe, you know, in that cynical point of view, um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the waste of subsidization. It's a holding us back. Uh, just another example. Um, so Kerry, we appreciate very much you spending the time with us sharing your views. Uh, you know, um, very, very interesting uh, interview here and, and, you know, enlightening, um, so let me ask you this. I ask everyone this here, and I just, you know, it's just a common question I like to ask people. Who's some of your favorite people, uh, past or present, um, elected or not? Um, well, I've, I've been telling people uh, who've asked me that so far if I, uh, you know, my favorite uh, historical figure would be uh, Calvin Coolidge from a political perspective, you know. They, you know, take a guy who can come reduce national debt, who can uh, roll back spending, roll back uh, government involvement, and not leave the country a total mess. Uh, and that guy is always going to be my hero every day. Um, I would, so yeah, I've, I really have looked up to him. I've uh, been reading a lot lately on some of the founders of the country, and I found a, um, a, a lot both to look up to and to 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 give me sort of cautionary tales about people like you know George Washington and uh, Benjamin Franklin and uh, James uh, James Joy and uh, um, I've uh, so I, I I've been finding a lot of little bits and pieces of some of those people to kind of inspire me uh, and uh, you know it's tough though uh, you know I suppose you've heard a. Uh, uh, Gary Johnson's latest issues with uh, trying to find a world leader who he looks up to. Um, and as a libertarian, finding a leader to look up to is sort of tough because throughout history, m most of them, more of them than not, have been big government people. You know, more of them than, than not have made more mistakes than not. Um, and so a lot of them that I find kind of inspiring are really more cautionary tales than uh, than anything else, um, it's a it's it's a difficult thing as a libertarian sometimes to look back through history and and find people to really look up to. 
Sure, and that was been in the news lately. I, I watched the entire hardball Chris Matthews town hall. It's totally taken out of context. I mean, people play 10 seconds of a clip, but if anyone decides to watch the full hour, 45 minutes, I mean, there's a lot more substance than that 10 second sure. clip, you know. Um, but um, well, Carrie, it's been a pleasure, and good luck in your campaign. Again, thank you for taking the time out here to talk with us and to. Um, you know, uh, explain your candidacy and your principles to our audience. It's uh, been very informative, and this is going to be rebroadcast at libertarianprogressive.com, where you'll see all our interviews. So we encourage you to, you know, look at them and share them with people. And um, so, well, thank you so much. Um, it's been a, a good interview here, and I hope you have a good weekend. Um, and thanks, thanks again. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciate it. All right. Oh, and let me just say, any final words um, before we go here, sir? Oh, just uh, get out and vote, everybody. Uh, even if you're not excited about the uh, presidential campaign, get out and vote down ballot. Uh, you know, the presidential campaign is a is a disaster. It's a sideshow. But there are good people around the country running for Congress. And if you're terrified about the idea of who's going to be president, just remember that there is a balance of power. The executive sometimes forgets this, but there is a balance of power. And if you get good people in Congress, good people in the Senate, then you can you can uh, counteract much of what goes on in the executive branch. All right, Bert for forkansas.com. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.